So now we're beginning our module on gaming. And one aspect of this will be your next portfolio item, where you're going to be creating your own computer game. A relatively simple text-based computer game that will be going through in the tutorial the processes of going about the creation of a computer game. But to start that off, we have to understand the fundamentals of not just gaming, which lead on to computer gaming, but we begin with the concept of play as a foundational element of games. So there are a range of different ways of understanding play. And over the years, there's been many attempts to explore it and examine what play means. So generally, there are seven accepted types of play. And I've given you those as a list. I've also given you a video clip of animals at play. So we can understand play a lot through children, but also through animals. Animals play in order to learn. Part of that learning is how to fight and hunt, and they practice on their siblings, ideally in a non-damaging um, non way, but it is in a way a practice for life. It's a preparation for life. And some aspects of play, particularly educational aspects of, of gaming and play, can be seen in that same light. But there are other ways of exploring play as well. So have a look at the list in terms of different um, types of play, um, being it narrative or transformative or imaginative, social, um, object-based, body-based, or attunement with um, others. And pick two of those and provide examples into teams of how you have experienced that type of play. So in trying to unpack some of these ideas, you may want to use ChatGTP to explore the concepts of put it into ChatGTP. Otherwise, we'll be able to answer your questions and explore them in more detail in the tutorials. But think about the different types of play that are commonly expressed. Now, over the years, play has been defined and distinguished in different ways. One of the earliest was by Holzinger in 1938, where he set down six different or five different categories of play that it involves freedom um, it's not ordinary something different uh, and it generally has some sort of order or structure but it's not connected with work or material wealth or interest or progression it's it's fun over the years though in the 60s Kalianus identified a range of other characteristics, many of them building upon um, Holzinger's, but mostly sort of aligning it more with the concept of uncertainty and that play is not predetermined. It involves some aspects, sometimes of chance, sometimes of effort or activity, but it's not just something you work through and you know the outcome from the start. Then, Coriolis' main contribution has been in categorising the forms and types of play. So, identified four types and gave them quick words so they were easy to remember. Um, Agon, or competitive play, where generally we compete against others, sometimes against ourselves, but there's some aspect of competition involved. This is commonly seen in sport, um, in chess, and most animal forms of play. But it's some competitive um, aspect of the play process. Then there's alia or chance. This is where randomness is the predominant aspect of the play. We don't, despite our effort or capability or interest, um, it's still going to be in the hands of chance. So very often gambling fits in with this sort of type of play, um, or simple games which involve the role of dice, such as snakes and ladder. So regardless of your skill level, it's going to depend upon the dice that are rolled 
as to determining whether or not someone is successful or not in that type of play. Then there's mimicry or role playing, where we take on the roles of others. Now this might be pretending to be um, cowboys and Indians. And even though you know you're not really a cowboy and you know that your friend is not an Indian, you conduct what is called suspension of disbelief. You pretend that they are and that you are and that you're in some US Western town in the 1800s as those characters. So you suspend your belief in the real world for the fantasy world that you've created and you take on those roles. And we see this in role playing and in theatre sports and things of that nature. And then you have um, Linux or Vertigo play where you try to disrupt your understanding of the real world. So you might spin around on the spot until you get dizzy and then you can't walk and you fall over. Or you might go on roller coasters and go up and down and, and so forth. So you're trying to alter the real world experience in a play based way. So these can also be combined in various ways. So chance and competition can be combined in the game of poker, where it does involve some level of skill, um, but there's still that chance and competitive aspect. Uh, collectible card games involve um, role play or um, understanding of the imagination, where the cards represent pocket monsters, the Pokemon games. And we combine that with some aspects of randomness where we shuffle the cards and depending upon which cards you get, depending upon how the game is going to play out. And then there's dance, which involves um, Linux or Whirlpool type adjustment of our reality, but it can be combined with competitiveness in terms of competitive dance. So the four um, forms of play can be combined in different combinations to form different types of play as well, or different aspects of play. And then he also identified two fundamental types of play. This is ludus, which is structured rule-based play, where there are rules such as in chess, where you've got to follow the rules and play out. And then there's uh, pedia, or unstructured and spontaneous play, picking up the chess pieces and throwing them at each other. That would be an example of spontaneous um, ludus, uh, pedia play. But it's just purely playfulness rather than games which tend to fit in with the ludus um, category of type of game, of, of play. So from your experience, share one of those types or forms of play that you have engaged with and share those on the teams. Now then Sutton Smith in the late 90s introduced the categories of play. So this looked at how there are different aspects of play based upon various categorical groupings of play. So the first of this is mind place or subjective play, where we're having dreams or imagination or role playing games, where it's, it's generally all conducted within our thought processes. Then we have solitary play, which is associated with hobbies and collections, listening to music, viewing art, um, playing with our pets, reading, yoga, building cars, um, doing crossword puzzles or bird watching. So whole ranges of play that previous categories of play wouldn't necessarily have included. But they are activities that could be associated with playfulness and enjoyment. Then you've got playful behaviours, such as playing tricks on one another, uh, putting a whoopee cushion down, um, uh, things of that nature. Um, then you've got, oh that, sorry, incorporates playful behaviours. So there's a range of different playful behaviours from playing tricks through to things such as um, playing a part in a, in a, in a workplace, um, or it may be things such as um, playing fair or playing by the rules. So there are sort of aspects where you 
are associated with the concept of play, where you take on various characteristics of those aspects, even though it may not be necessarily enjoyable or frivolous or things that we would have previously categorized as play. Then there's informal play or social play, such as joking around, having, uh, engaging in parties, um, traveling, um, having a potluck meal, um, going to a mall, babysitting, um, a whole lot of other aspects of um, informal play. Then there's what's called vicarious audience play, where we watch others do things and we find that enjoyable and playful, such as watching TV or movies, cartoons, um, watching others play sport, um, watching the theatre or music performances. So where we're not necessarily engaged with them ourselves, but it's still an enjoyable, playful experience for us. Then there is performance play where we actually do these things, such as playing a piano, uh, playing in a sporting event um, or a theatrical performance, um, things of that nature. Then we have celebratory or um, festival based play, uh, having a birthday party or Christmas celebration, or special events. Um, then you've got contests, which are our more traditional games and sports with athletes and gambling, and casinos and golf and parlor games and the Olympics. Most board games and card games would fit within that sort of categorization. And then there's risky or deep play, where there's some consequences if things go wrong, such as um, caving or motorsports racing or kayaking or hand gliding, bungee jumping, things of that nature. So various other ways of looking at play. And as we think about play in association with games and in association with computer games, you need to be considering these types of categorizations because they can help you creatively come up with the experiences of those games and ways of building in different aspects of play that make them enjoyable for different people. Because um, not everyone wants to play in the same way all the time. There are different approaches and types of play that we engage with. Um, and different people have different affinities for those. So there are different ways of designing a computer game, taking into account these various aspects of play. So into teams, share some examples of these different categories of play that you've experienced. Three examples over the last week. Now the final aspect is rhetorics of play. So Sutton Smith developed this as not characteristics, but more the, f uh, not quite philosophies, but approaches to play that go beyond the characteristics. So for example, one rhetoric of play would be around fate, where we're accepting that we don't have total control, that chance is going to play its role, or the gods, or some other force is going to play its role in the outcome of our play. Um, there's a rhetoric of power and power relationships that are exhibited in play, that others have might be stronger or smarter or more agile, and that these will have more wealth and money, and these have an aspect of determination of how the play progresses. Then there's aspects of identity and how as we present ourselves in this play form, most commonly seen through role play and drama performances, where we take on the identity of others, but it can also be our own identity, how our identity is presented when we play sport in terms of our prowess, or when we're dancing, how that represents ourselves in terms of our capacity to be a dancer or a singer. Then there's the imaginary aspects of play and how we are creative and go through processes of being able to um, generate an imaginary space and world as part of our play, but also our capacity to um, suspend disbelief in the real world so that we can engage in that imaginary play. Then there's the rhetoric of the self and how we develop as, our, as individuals through play, where the, our process of play may give us a greater understanding of ourselves. Um, are we competitive by nature? Are we helpful and help others 
um, win or was it mostly about how we win? A um, whole range of aspects that we learn more about ourselves through the process of play. And then finally, there's rhetorics of play around just the frivolity of play. Can we just go out and muck about and just have fun, regardless of consequences and circumstances and no need for any structures or rules? Um, or do we need to have some sort of purpose for play and things of that nature? Are you someone that reads all the rules before you play a game and need to see those rules adhered to in order for it to be enjoyable? Or are you just engaging with the um, social experience of play and you're not really caring at all about the rules and who wins or and that sort of aspect? So that all of these different rhetorics of play shape the, the play experience. And again, when you consider computer game development, you need to consider how these rhetorics will be different for different people and how your game will support these different rhetorics in different ways. So our understanding of play allows us to explore the development of games and computer games from different perspectives. And you should see already that there are lots of different um, combinations and subcategories and how no one game, just as no one life, could encompass all of these aspects all of the time. You will need to make various decisions in developing your game as to which of these aspects that you have incorporated and think about the consequences of that in terms of the gameplay and the experiences of the players of your game. So think about some of these rhetorics of play and share into teams one of the rhetorics you've experienced today.